Fuzzy Mud by Lewis Sacker, Chapter 24 The Situation in Heathcliff, Three Months Later Three months after Tamea found Chad in the woods, Jonathan Fitzman was subpoenaed to testify at the Heathcliff disaster hearings. Donna Jones, a lawyer from Sunray Farm, was seated by Fitzy's side. Ms. Jones had instructed Jonathan Fitzman never to use the word disaster. Instead, he was to refer to it as the situation in Heathcliff. Donna Jones, Esquire. There is no evidence of any connection between Biolene and the situation in Heathcliff. Senator Wright. That is what we are trying to determine. About a year and a half ago, Mr. Fitzman, when you first testified before this committee, you stated that your organisms could not live in the natural environment, correct? You said the oxygen in the air would kill them. Poof! Jonathan Fitzman. That's right. That's what I've been saying. The disaster, I, I, I mean the situation in Heathcliff, is horrible, and I feel really terrible when I think of those people, but it couldn't have been my ergies. Senator Wright. Just to be clear, after you grow these ergonoms, they are combined with other substances and made into bioline. Is that correct? Jonathan Fitzman. There's a lot more to it than that, but I guess that's close enough. Senator Wright. My question is this. Are the ergonoms in the bioline solution still alive? Donna Jones, Esquire. There's no evidence of any connection between bioline and the situation in Heathcliff. Senator Wright, I just want to know, are the ergonoms and bioline living? Jonathan Fitzman, yes, that's what gives them their energy. It's their vitality. Senator Wright, and are these, are they still reproducing every 36 minutes? Jonathan Fitzman, no, once they've been congealed in the bioline, there's no more cell division. Otherwise, the ratio would be all wrong. Look, you have to understand, if I thought my ergies would kill someone, I would never, ever have let them out into the world. Violin is supposed to save mankind, not destroy us. Senator Wright, Mr. Fitzman, please try not to wave your arms so much you almost hit your lawyer. Donna Jones, Esquire. I'm used to it, Senator. I've learned when to duck. Senator Haltings, I know you've said you have all kinds of safety precautions, but just suppose, Mr. Fitzman, just suppose that some violin is spilled. I presume most of the liquid would then evaporate. Jonathan Fitzman, yes, and the ergies would disintegrate. Senator Haltings, but if they didn't die, would these now free organisms be able to start reproducing again? Jonathan Fitzman, I, I don't know, maybe if they were still alive, but by the time all the liquid evaporated, the air would have already killed them. Any car that runs on bioline has to be equipped with a vacuum fuel injection system. I'm now working on a way to make sure the fuel tanks remain warm in winter, even if the engine is turned off and the car is parked outside in the ice and snow. Senator Haltings, you testified last year that an ergonym engages in cell division every 36 minutes. Jonathan Fitzman. Yes, until they've been congealed in bioline. Senator Haltings. With trillions upon trillions of cells dividing all the time, aren't there ever mutations? Donna Jones, Esquire. There is no evidence of any connection between bioline and the situation in Heathcliff. Jonathan Fitzman, you have to understand, mutations are bound to happen. But that's no reason for everybody to get all freaked out. Normally, when cell division occurs, the new organism is an exact copy of the original. But when there's a mutation, that just means there's a defect of some kind. For whatever reason, the copy isn't exact. The defective organism usually cannot survive, and that's the end of it. The rest of the ergies go on doing what they've been doing. Senator Haltings, but is it possible that an ergonym could have mutated in a way that made it capable of surviving in oxygen? Jonathan Fitzman, the odds of that happening are like a trillion to one. Senator Haltings, a trillion to one. Okay, last time you were here, you testified that there are more than a quadrillion ergonyms in a gallon of violine. So, a quadrillion divided by a trillion equals a thousand. At a trillion to one odds, that would mean in every gallon of bioline, there are a thousand ergonoms that can live in the natural environment. Jonathan Fitzman, no, that's not right. 
I had already factored in the numbers of mutations when I said the odds were a trillion to one. You're double multiplying. Senator Haltings, let's suppose someone spills a few drops of violine, and all the normal organisms instantly go poof. But there might be one mutated organism that survives. Then, 36 minutes later, it will make an exact copy of itself. We'll have two ergies, both capable of living in oxygen. And 36 minutes after that, four. And after just one day, there'd be more than a billion of these oxygen surviving organisms, and 36 minutes after that, a billion more. Donna Jones Esquire. This is pure speculation. I think we can all agree that there has been no concluding, uh, conclusive evidence of any connection between violine and the situation in Heathcliff. Senator Haltings. What led you to the conclusion that you needed to keep the fuel tanks in uh, fuel tanks warm in winter, Donna Jones Esquire. Mr. Fitzman simply wants to be sure that the people who drive violine powered cars don't have any difficulties. Jonathan Fitzman. You have to understand, I never wanted to hurt anyone. Senator Haltings. Unfortunately, a lot of people were hurt. Chapter 25, Wednesday, November 3rd, 2 12 p.m. A long line of cars stretched from the front of Woodridge Academy all the way out to Richmond Road, blocking traffic. Many of the mom and dad drivers had tears in their eyes. They hadn't been told the names of the missing children, only that their own children were safe. At the front of the school, each car was met by a teacher who first verified the identity of the driver and then went to the proper classroom and escorted the student to the car. These children were often caught off guard and embarrassed by their parents' hugs and kisses. A uniformed officer kept watch. It was a slow process, and it had just gotten even slower. There was one car stopped in front of the school that hadn't moved for a long time. The dad driver, who had patiently waited in line so long, silently counting his blessings, had told the teacher who'd come to meet him that his name was John Walsh. He had shown his driver's license and said he was Marshall Walsh's father. He's in the seventh grade. The teacher had smiled at him and said she had known Marshall since he'd been in fourth grade. He's a great kid. Mr. Walsh waited. He watched as other cars pulled up behind him and in front of him. Parents and children were united. The cars drove off and other cars took their places. Still, he waited, growing more anxious with each passing second. His hand gripped his steering wheel. Mrs. Thaxton's voice resounded over the PA system, which could be heard outside as well as in the classroom. Marshal Walsh, please report to the office. Mr. Walsh trembled. Mrs. Thaxton's voice rang out a second time, sounding a bit more frantic. Marshal Walsh, come to the office now. A little while later, the teacher returned to Mr. Walsh's car, not with Marshall, but with a police officer.